It's probably as cliche as some of the best cliches you've heard, but sometimes we like to say in the audio and video industry that audio is far more important than video. In fact, people will definitely tune out if your audio is bad, but they'll stick with you if your audio is good. talk about why and how to produce great audio for your live broadcast. Again, probably just as important, if not much more important, than your video quality. We'll be talking with an expert, Mr. Mike Russell, and we'll get into some simple tips that you can use to improve your audio for your live broadcasts. Join us for today's episode of Wirecast Live, and I'll be right back after these opening credits. Welcome back to another episode of Wirecast Live. You are, if you are joining us live, welcome. We are live on Facebook, YouTube, and Periscope. And you can join in the conversation at Telestream Wirecast on Facebook or Wirecast Tube on YouTube. And if you're joining us after the fact, on demand, you can catch this, uh, you can catch us live every week on Thursdays at 2.30 p.m. Pacific time on the social media channels. Right here, we like to talk about all things live streaming and live video. We are the makers of Wirecast software, and each week we try to bring you tips related to live video, live video production, live streaming, and all that goes around that. Some people on the show have talked about how to do a business around live streaming, how to grow your audience, how to do better social media marketing with video. Uh, we really cover a lot of different topics and a lot of different guests. And today we're going to be talking a lot about audio and covering both the simple to advanced tips and techniques you can use to improve your audio quality. Again, it's so important for live video. Uh, if your audio is bad, people will tune out like that. It's the unseen part of your broadcast, but it's so critical. So I'm excited to get into that. And if you are new to video and video streaming, then and this is a great place to tune in each week or go through our archives and learn stuff. We go hands-on with video software like Wirecast. We do tips. We also have our guests bring in um, things that, and tools that they've learned or suggest uh, using in conjunction with your live video software like Wirecast. We do have an email list if you want to get notified of upcoming shows, topics, and guests. We won't spam you. We just let you know who's coming on the show and what we're going to be talking about. Next week, in fact, we have a huge guest coming on the show, Miss Amy Porterfield, who is a very famous podcaster, as well as a business coach, and has some great curriculum online. You can check her out just by Googling Amy Porterfield. She's a fantastic guest. I'm super excited to interview her. I think it's going to be a great show. So mark your calendars next Thursday, July 19th at 2.30 p.m. Pacific time, right here on our Wirecast channels. So um, the other thing we like to do is celebrate you out there, you viewers, you viewers of Wirecast or your users of Wirecast, people who are streaming right now or any time in the future with Wirecast. If you mark your live broadcast with the hashtag, where is Wirecast? That's all one word, hashtag, where is Wirecast? We will find it. And each week we pick a winner uh, to of our stream of the week. And this week we have selected one of our favorite live video producers, Mr. George Kennedy. And George Kennedy does a, l a number of live shows. He's also uh, a freelance videographer and producer. And I actually will pull this up right here. The winning stream that he did just this last week was a great live interview panel and session on drones and the FAA regulations around that. He's done a great job producing the live show with Wirecast. You can see George here on the right. And um, yeah, I'm actually really curious to go back and watch this episode because it looks like they really get into some of the very interesting things around aerial photography and video flying. I mean, drones have become more and more important to production around live video and on-demand video. And so I think George, if you are curious about 
about this, you can check this out. This is the District Digital Creatives, the DDC show on YouTube. They also stream on Facebook as well. So check them out. Uh, some great work here. George, thanks for sharing this live stream that you did with Wirecast. And it looks like maybe you're using Rendezvous there. I don't know if you're uh, watching right now, George, leave a comment. Let us know how the show went. Yep, looks like you're right there, man. Congrats. Okay, so I'm going to pull up some of your comments here so I can make sure I'm uh, staying in touch with the conversation. If you have questions or you have other um, sort of points you want to share or live streams you want to share, please let us know. Leave a comment uh, and let us, uh, we will keep an eye on that. And maybe we can feature your stream in the stream of the week next week. Okay, so without further ado, I would like to get into our guest and our topic today. Uh, joining us live from his home in the United, King United Kingdom. Um, he's up late. He's from the Isle of Wight. And his name is Mike Russell. And Mike Russell is the founder and creative director of... I'm going to get this wrong because I wrote it down here. Just one second. Uh, <laughs> there it is. I had it on my notes, but I, I left my notes for him. He's the founder and uh, creative director of Music Radio Creative in the United Kingdom. And he is an audio expert and I actually met him at Social Media Marketing World. And he is well known in the industry for his audio expertise, but also just being a great guy and uh, an all around beautiful human being. So Mike, I really want to thank you for coming on the show. And it's been lovely getting to know you. These uh, We did a tech test yesterday with him. And uh, I really, I love talking to him. So he's going to be giving us a great overview of some simple to advanced techniques on audio and how to do it. So Mike, welcome. Andrew, thank you for the introduction. Amazing. You, you could just say <laughs> MRC if you like. <laughs> no problem. It's great to be on the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really appreciate it. I mean, you've stayed up late for us, and uh, we want to welcome you on the show. This is your first appearance on the show. And, um, you know, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, sort of, we'll get into your background and, and how you got into audio, but why don't you tell us a little bit about when you came to Wirecast? When did you start using it, and what, how long have you been uh, sort of using it for some of the content you're producing? So I think I started using Wirecast when, um, pretty much when it must have been around the time that YouTube was going big on letting you go live and, and do things live. And then I, I, I think I just started Googling around and Wirecast kept coming up everywhere. Um, so I gave it a go and it's a, it's a piece of software I love. I've, I've been using it to, I mean, you develop it, don't you, with new features all the time. There's not just YouTube now. There's, there's Periscope, like you mentioned. There's Facebook Live. It's just fantastic what you can do. Yes, there is. And, uh, you know, if you came on when YouTube came on board, I, I honestly think YouTube doesn't get enough credit for sort of leading the pack amongst the major sort of social networks and sort of, you know, um, social media channels out there for uh, bringing live there. I think they really did innovate and they continue to push the envelope. And I think they were really the first major partner of Wirecast. And we actually made a version of Wirecast just for YouTube users. So I think uh, if you came on back then, then you've been doing this a while. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And also, I'm a massive ScreenFlow user. So ah. um, I, I love all the features in there, particularly the audio features. Um, you've got a great audio feature. I think it's the smooth volume levels mm -hmm. inside ScreenFlow. Absolutely amazing. So uh, yeah, I use that all the time. Oh, see, that's, that's so good to hear from a, a professional like yourself. I'm constantly using the smooth volume uh, feature. You know, that's kind of ScreenFlow is my sort of de facto or default um, audio tool, even though, you know, Know, it may not originally be thought of as that. It's mostly a screen capture and video editing software, but uh, the, the audio tools, they are amazing in there. They, they bring in a lot of the Apple filters. I've been playing around with those using the pitch and the compression and just getting, uh, and, and that smooth volume levels is so critical to just getting a, a nice sort of even volume setting across the whole video. So it's good to hear some reaffirmation there. I'm glad you used ScreenFlow. So Mike, Tell us a little bit about how did you uh, become an audio expert? I don't know if you would call yourself that or not. I would call you that, but uh, you're welcome to. I'm an to... aspiring one. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all? I think all experts are aspiring experts. <laughs> so, um, well, I, I guess for me, it all started um, back in radio, um, back in the days before YouTube was around. Now, of course, all these tutorials are online. You, you've got the YouTube University. You can learn any piece of software really on YouTube. So that's I know that's how a lot of people now are learning audio, audio production, uh, pieces 
pieces of software like Adobe Audition, like Logic Pro. Um, but for me, it was it was back in the day before of all of this wonderful digital technology. Um, it was in the day of DAT tapes, mini discs. I don't know, Andrew, if you remember any of these cassette I tapes. I do. I had a mini disc recorder. I would record <laughs> voice memos on it. There you go. Even even vinyl, even queuing up vinyl. Um, when I first started in radio, I, I am just about old enough to have been playing vinyl on the radio. And um, you had to kind of take it and you had to take it back at sort of quarter of a turn uh, and oh, all of that stuff. I, I kind of miss that stuff. I, I think it's coming back with some of the plugins now, the kind of retro sound. But um, that's where it all started. So I started in a radio studio uh, with um, uh, a mentor of mine. Well, I'm, I'm privileged to have had uh, a few mentors over the years who have really helped me to develop my style. Um, but yeah, it's all learning sort of there in a studio, just tweaking knobs and doing it with analog gear and then kind of moving into i mean when uh, adobe audition wasn't even adobe audition when it was cool edit pro um <laughs> just seeing the wonder of multi-track mixing and I mean, you can do that in in ScreenFlow. you can uh you can mix multiple audio sources together in there and in in, in wirecast as well you've got the opportunity to bring in audio from everywhere so it's just amazing you can do this now all all inside a computer yeah it's uh i i think that um well, actually, I don't know if you've been watching on Netflix or some of the shows there, but they really are kind of going back into the history of the movement into sort of sample artists and starting with vinyl. And, and, and I, you know, there's this great show, I think, called the um, uh, the sort of the breakdown or the um, something that where that it just kind of covers the original sort of movement of, of taking other audio and playing it and mixing it together. And then from there, as the digital tools expanded for that, that's just how most people make music now there's just really very you just don't do it any other way right you're constantly using a digital audio workstation for everything yeah i mean look at some of the the, the biggest producers in the world i think Calvin Harris uses Logic Pro. Every everything is done in there. Every instrument is recorded, either recorded into there or just sampled MIDI style. It's it's amazing. Hmm. So you started in radio. You moved into sort of started freelancing. And I'm looking. I actually have the the Music Radio Creative website up here, and it looks like uh, there's nothing you don't do when it comes to audio here, right? So uh, we make awesome audio, and you've got a number of great clients uh, that I think anyone would be proud to boast on their website. Right, as as customers and so you write songs you produce you do podcasts what types of work do you do and maybe what parts do you really enjoy most of the types of audio work that you're doing right now uh, that's a great question so um we do everything from uh, voiceovers. So we work with over 100 different voiceovers from around the world. Uh, something that really excites me about the work I do is getting the opportunity not only to work with talent from around the world. So we work with voiceovers in Spanish, in German, uh, from all corners of, of the earth, really. Uh, Japanese. We've just finished um, sung jingles for a radio station in China. So it's um, it's great. So voiceovers, uh, music beds, uh, sung jingles. Uh, we work obviously on podcast intros uh, we work with youtubers on those those little bumpers that start off their their show they they tend to be really short like three or five seconds um but we do stuff like that um and i'm always excited about um and always have been about manipulating voices and and changing things to sound completely different. So mm. whenever I can find a plugin that can make your voice sound a bit crazy or have a strange <laughs> effect, um, obviously the the reverb, yes, is, is a really good one. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's my favorite. Uh, so 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 much so that I have it on a on a fader on my mix. Uh, yes, there. you had it right <laughs> there. I was really impressed. That almost I almost jumped out of my seat right there. <laughs> there you go. Uh, pitch shifting is a good one. Um, yeah, it's it's just fantastic. I just uh, I love changing audio, so that's kind of where where I come from on this. Yeah, fantastic. So okay, so I think that we've we've established your bona fides, right? So you are you're a, you know. Um, Clearly, somebody who's just, you're doing this not only full-time, it's not only your passion and uh, you're, you're great at it. Um, let's talk about, specifically, our audience is very interested in uh, when audio meets video, and particularly in the live area of production. Now, some people use Wirecast for recording uh, to disc, and then they upload the videos later, but sometimes what saves them time is the fact that it's all produced on the fly, and you can get a very high level of production, just like we're doing now, and not have to go back and, and assemble it all in a nonlinear editor. It's basically they're kind of live to tape and then they can just do some minor cleanup 
cuts and edits and then and then post it. So um, in that sense, you really have to do a lot of the legwork up front. You have to set your microphones. You have to set your um, any audio compression or filters that you're using. Uh, so why don't we talk a little bit about how, first of all, let's kind of set the stage. What does someone need to be thinking about? Some key concepts or simple concepts that they can uh, start thinking about when approaching live video audio, for examples, you know, that you might use in Wirecast. Well, that's a, a great point, Andrew. So if you are recording uh, live to tape, live to drive, as it were, um, the first thing you want to make sure you're doing is getting all of your audio levels um, consistent. So mm. you're not having to go through and use a compressor or some kind of mastering uh, tool to sort of bring up the quiet stuff and push down the loud stuff. Stuff that I, I think we all struggle with, you know, you've got a pre-recorded bumper and the, the volume is kind of peaking on zero, nearly zero dB. Uh, so it's like really, really loud. And then the microphone is maybe really quiet. Um, so just getting those audio levels correct um, is a great place to start. And if you happen to be using a kind of mixing board that has um, some maybe LED meters on, uh, you can then use those meters to try and make sure you're, you're kind of peaking at the same point for each mic and for each music source that you're bringing in. Um, if it's going through Wirecast, then um, I'm sure there are, there are methods and ways that you can kind of change the level of audio there. Uh, so that's important. And also to make sure that you're getting the audio sounding really good at source, because the last thing you want to do is have it all recorded to drive and then notice there's a there's a huge hiss or there's a big extractor fan or something like that mm -hmm. going off in the background, having to do that post-production, which you can do. And it, it does work and it will improve the quality of your audio. Um, but if you can change these things while you're recording and, and make your life easier, uh, then highly recommend it. Uh, definitely consider introducing uh, hardware into your chain as well as using the software, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, I have uh, a mixing board that I absolutely love for live. It's the Soundcraft Signature 12 MTK, and it has uh, 12 different uh, channels on there. So I can I can mix everything and, and tweak the, the levels on the fly. I can kind of fade up and down music if I'm talking over intros. I can, I, as I demonstrated earlier, I can bring in reverb and other effects. Okay, let's... Uh, um Stop right there. The Soundcraft, what was it? Uh, Signature 12 MTK. Okay. They do have a, a couple of other versions. There is the Signature, well, it's overkill, the Signature 22. Uh -huh. So the Signature 12 has 12 channels. The 22 has 22. That's right, like, right, right, right. It's the first um, thing you learn in audio with boards and stuff. <laughs> Typically, the numbers denote inputs or outputs often. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Um, so let's look at that real quick. I've got that on my uh, board here, and it looks pretty great. Looks, uh, um, I've got it on my screen here. So this this is just a, a it, handy to have on the desk next to you, and and usually yes. something you want to feed your mics in before you're going to your software, Wirecast or something like that. Very much so, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say I would highly recommend something like, like this for live streamers. You can get something uh, much simpler, like a, st a bog standard audio interface with a couple of inputs. Mm -hmm. um, but with this, you have more fine grain control. As you can see from the, the pictures you're showing there on the screen, not only does it have faders, so you can mm -hmm. physically fade up and down music and bits like that. It's got EQ, um, which means you can you can brighten uh, the, the treble or the bass on so your So the voice EQ, of, just for novices, this would be this yeah. these green and blue buttons in the center or up here? So Mid they're highs. just above green and blue buttons. Okay. They're the, um, the, the gray, gray ones buttons. Here. Yeah. Got it. And that's treble, mid-range, and bass. And what that will do is it will increase different or decrease different frequencies in your voice so you can kind mm -hmm. of get your mic sounding good. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a brilliant thing to do, again, before going into the software to use a piece of kit like this that can make you sound just a little bit better. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it's it's fantastic. I love and it. And you recommend, and I, I heard this. You said close to source. This is something um, a lot of audio engineers I've spoken with. Um, it's a concept that I've I've begun to sort of understand a little better. Which is basically like if you're going to be adjusting things like gain and volume, and like you said, the the EQ or equal, and that's short for equalization. Or equalizers. Yes. Okay. Um, if you're going to be doing that, you want to do that almost as close to the microphone as possible in terms of where in the chain. So uh, so on the board, like as you said, the mixing board or the, that's the best place to start making the most drastic adjustments. Is that correct? Yeah, 
definitely definitely okay. yeah if you can get everything sounding good on your mixing board and then just feed it into something like wirecast um that that is the best place for you to be really yeah definitely. do you find that and this do you find with uh, that different software responds differently to the input levels? So, because sometimes you'll everything sounds great on your board, but you bring it into your computer through, well, I don't know, some sort of a capture card or through the USB or something. And for some reason, the computer, your Mac or your PC, is just not recognizing the levels in the same way the board recognizes them. Is that a common issue? Do you find that? <laughs> and that can be a pain. So um, it really depends. So I'm I'm. Uh, 100%, uh, pretty much 100% Apple and mm -hmm. Mac. Um, and generally, I, my experience with Mac is that things tend to work okay. Um, but I do remember my PC days, and I do remember having more problems with PCs, but mm -hmm. I don't want to start a whole PC-Mac debate here. <laughs> right, um, you could just set off a whole Firestorm here. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but I know with PCs... Um, they are a little more fiddly, aren't they? You've got multiple things to, that you can change there. And perhaps once you're feeding in the audio from the desk, there's then another uh, uh, probably software control or, or something. In It's so long since I've used a PC, but in control panel, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. and in the sound options, you might have an option in there where you can then turn the volume up or down. And I, I remember I've, I've used usb mics before with pcs and had mm -hmm. them distorting and trying to figure out why and then you you go in and you find there's a like a, a virtual fader that you just have to pull down because it's a bit too hot so mm -hmm. definitely it's it is an issue you can come up against and, do yeah, you typically like with this mixing board the soundcraft do you go usb direct into just a port on the back of your mac like a usb I port do. okay i do yes and um the reason that I've selected the model that I have here is each um, it separates out each fader, so each uh, input and output to be separate channels on your PC or Mac. Mm -hmm. So as opposed to most mixing boards that generally just feed out the master output, the master fader, uh, you can be more fine grain than that. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have software at the other end that then recognizes, you know, channel one, channel two, uh, you know, channel seven and eight stereo, um, you can do all kinds of great stuff with, you know, using different audio sources on in, in different parts of, of the software. And I, I do that particularly inside Adobe Audition. You can have a multi-track uh, with different faders having like different voices and different pieces of music on. So it's, it's really good. That's very cool. So um, having uh, kind of that, that counterpart between both the physical board and then the software on the other end that can kind of respect its, you know, kind of understand how the board is arranging its channels and sort of see them independently is a big deal um, if you're planning to get a little more advanced. Definitely, yeah. Okay. And so um, now... Let's talk about, so in Wirecast, so it all has to come together in your live streaming software, your production switcher, whatever you're encoding to or recording to. And you mentioned um, checking your levels matching between your sources. So if you say, for example, have a music intro or a video or, you know, you said you do a lot of jingles and then you also have your microphones and you're going to be kind of mashing all that together in one show or one podcast, you want to kind of make sure that they're all that, that nothing's way louder than something else, that your music isn't just blowing everyone's ears out and then your, your microphone's very quiet. How do you approach that? Is it, is it all sort of done in like Wirecast or some the final software and you kind of check the levels and do a quick run through and, and make sure everything is where you expect it to be? Yeah, exactly. You can do something like that. So um, with microphones, it's a, it's a little tougher because you, you just have to kind of talk uh, and get a level that is, is sort of peaking uh, where you'd like it. Usually around minus 6 dB is a good place to start, so you're not going too hot. Um, when you're using multiple music sources, something I like to do, um, and I can do really easily in Adobe Audition, is, is generate a quick test tone. Um, so in the effects and generate uh, area, there is a, an opportunity to generate a tone like a 1K tone like this. And you can play that um, out of the various music sources that you're bringing in. So say if you have a computer that's playing music and um, for jingles, I have an iPad plugged into a channel on my mixing uh, board as well. And I'll have that tone on the, the various music sources. Um, so then I can make sure that each level is exactly right because the tone will will help me get it to the right the right level so uh, tones can help me a lot 
Interesting. So tones are great for level setting, basically, because they're yeah. so consistent. They're not jumping up and down. They're not like a voice or a music track. So you can kind of get the loud. Sound. Okay. So the tone generator, does the does your board have a tone generator or is it something you need to provide previously and in, in input? So yeah, you would um, you can you can create your own. So uh, if you're if you're using Adobe Audition, um, there is um, an effect in the effects menu. If you go to generate and then tones, um, you can create not only a one K uh, test tone that sounds like this. I don't know if are you hearing that? I am. I am. So so you get the one K, um, but you can also um, you can use it to create crazy tones. Uh, including tones that sound like uh, this. <laughs> okay, I think I think this is a good time to show your screen because you're doing some cool stuff in Adobe Audition, and I don't want people to kind of miss the what you're doing. So let me cool. pull oh, let yeah. me full screen this real fast, and then yeah. we will. Um, you can take that back. So what you have here, you have Adobe Audition, and yeah. somehow you are actually playing and doing sounds and tones here, but they're coming through back to us. So through Skype. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm, and the way I'm doing this is I'm feeding it through my Soundcraft uh, mixing desk. Um, so what I've got set up when I'm talking to you, Andrew, right now, mm -hmm. I've got a mix minus set up on this desk. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that you are just receiving the channels that I choose to send uh, through an aux send on my desk. Mm -hmm. So I'm sending you uh, my microphone, and I'm also sending you the output of Adobe Audition, mm -hmm. um, but I'm not sending you um, your your my um, own audio. Your audio back. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah, we'd get that feedback loop. How are um, you outputting sound from Adobe Audition into the board? Is it a physical cable coming out of your headphones speak output from your computer, or is it just coming through the USB sort of two way communication of between the board? That's an excellent question. So I can I can actually show you. So again, this is another beauty of the um, the the. the board that I use, um, you have the ability to root audio in all kinds of different places. So if I go into the Audition CC preferences and I go to, um, first of all, audio hardware, mm -hmm. and you'll see here that I've got the Soundcraft Signature 12 MTK mm -hmm. as the input and output. And Let then when I go in there to, for folks. there you go. And then when you click over to audio channel mapping, um, I have the output as analog seven and eight and that is a stereo channel on the mixing board that i have hold on now I'm, so right around seven and eight audio channel mapping i see file channels and then one and two left and right and then i see yes. output here okay file channels uh one two one through six looks like oh but it looks like there's a scroll bar yeah, so this is um, this is where Adobe Audition has lots and lots of different possibilities for output. Um, so with the output here, I'm just interested in the one L and the two R. That's left and right channel. Mm -hmm. um, you've got C for center, LFE, LS. This is all for surround. So I mean, yeah, wow, other stuff, Doesn't virtual stop. reality, you know, <laughs> so all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. but but really, yeah, when when you're using Audition for um, you know stereo sound, it's just L and R. And uh, so I'm outputting that to channel seven and eight, which is a stereo fader oh, on I my see. desk. Seven and, and eight. Okay. Yeah. And the really cool thing is, um, so you asked if I'm using a physical wire. Mm -hmm. I'm not. This is all going through the USB connector. Mm -hmm. And you have an option on the, on this particular desk to say, I want to get the USB output or I want to get the, the actual wired output. So there are, there are multiple inputs on there. You've got... Um, an XLR input, uh, a TRS jack input, um, which can then go obviously to a mic or to a guitar or to an iPad. And then obviously you've got the option of USB, um, mm. which is the output from your computer. So this is actually what you hear from Adobe Audition. Um, and, and there's no wire. So, it, well, there is a wire, there is USB, obviously, but mm -hmm. it's uh, about as clean a signal as you can get. So, yeah. Awesome. Okay, so you're basically, you've routed, uh, you've routed your audio um, from Adobe Edition to uh, left and right, one and two, to, to seven and eight on your Soundcraft uh, inputs. And then on the board, you said, I want, uh, what I want you to look for is that USB signal coming in on those channels, or those are the inputs. We're not going to use XLR. We're not going to use 
um, uh, TRS, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay, and then from there on the board, you can actually then create the mix minus um, that includes yes. those that audio plus your own microphone, and you send that back in to uh, your computer to me. Yeah. So, um, and this is where it gets interesting. So now I have um, a Focusrite two i two audio interface. Mm. So my mix minus is going into that audio interface and I am sending you um, the audio from that audio interface. So uh, you essentially get a clean mix minus back to you. So yeah. So you've got um, two uh, devices plugged in to the computer. Yeah. One, ah, uh, <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. see, sometimes this is one of those advanced tips. You may, sometimes you need more than one interface to, with the computer, right? A hundred percent. Yeah, a hundred percent. Definitely. Um, and yeah, I, I highly recommend it because yeah, I, I do all kinds of crazy stuff. Like I have, um, when I work over in uh, Logic on, on music and MIDI stuff, uh, this is all going through my, um, my audio interface. So I'm mm -hmm. not using uh, the mixing desk at the moment. So that is, is coming out on the same channel as you. So you, you wouldn't be able to hear this, but um, at least I know where everything is rooting. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Can't hear because it, it can get really complicated. Yeah, um, I imagine. And yeah. It's it's definitely stuff that you you have to you have to play about with a little bit. But do you, um, do you find you that different applications compete? Like Skype tries to grab a channel, or if there's an order of operations, sometimes you have to open, you know, Logic before you need to open Premiere or sorry uh, Audition, and or you you at least need to set up the uh, the interface that they're working with before you open the next application, and then otherwise things might get muddled, or they might grab a signal or an interface and 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 it's monopolize it. Yeah, exactly. That's that's a good point. Generally, it tends to be okay. Um, but uh, another piece of software that I use is from Rogue Amoeba uh, called Loopback, and uh, and that allows you to um, virtually inside of your computer basically root um, audio all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, I could actually I could bring it up uh, to show you uh loopback loopback yeah uh, we used to use soundflower but i'm not sure soundflower is still often used that's right yeah i i used to use soundflower so that was um that was a really cool project i i'm pretty sure if i if i remember correctly that was like an open source kind so. of thing yeah and then I, I think what the the loopback the rogue amoeba people did is they they somehow got the code and said okay we're gonna we're gonna take this on now and develop it further and they right. kind of pretty much integrated it in. Um, but yeah, so I do um, live stream audio here, um, which is something I use for live streaming, and mix minus. Uh, so what I'm doing here is I am, ah, this is not something I'm using when I'm speaking to you, mm -hmm. um, but it's, again, this gives me the opportunity to route just like a single microphone to people um, uh, and things like that. So. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it can all get quite complicated, though, Andrew. So I imagine, <laughs> yeah, this, yeah, I we wanna... should. I don't want to bog people down too much, but <laughs> I, I mean, think people are beginning to kind of maybe. I think the key takeaway here, if this is sort of seems confusing to you, and it is confusing because even you know, Mike gets confused. I get confused. Obviously, Mike, you you're, you've been doing this a lot longer than I have, but I, I everyone always oh, asks no, no, me, what's the hardest too. part about live streaming and doing a studio? And, and honestly, it's the audio routing. It's it's figuring out the mix minuses and who needs to hear what, and and then putting it all together. And 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 sometimes you're creating two or three or four or five different mixes uh, for different purposes. You know, Deborah Lee needs to hear something different than what I need to hear, and uh, the audience needs to hear something different than what. Deborah Lee or me need to hear, right? So um, it gets it, get, it can get quite confusing. But having these tools like this, like Audio Amoeba, and knowing that you may need more than one interface, having a mixing board, but also remembering you might need something like a, a Scarlett Focusrite or another USB device that can go into your computer and then go somewhere else um, can be very helpful because you need multiple tools to tackle this, this problem. Totally right? agree. Yeah. So yeah. you were talking about tones so i actually want to go back to that so you were generating some tones and you were saying that they're very great for audio level setting and it sounded like one thing you recommend is not necessarily using your software like wirecast i mean i would expect sort of an audio engineer person like you know yourself to 
uh, kind of run everything through the board. And so that way you have your control and everything right there, your faders, and you can make adjustments much faster on the fly. Um, but you're actually inputting, you know, jingles, music, and everything through the board with your mic. So you can kind of have it all in one place right there. And then you feed the master out to your, your, your live broadcasting software. Is that, is that accurate? That's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that helps you set your, your level. So why don't you talk, why don't you go back and show us how you generate those tones out of, you showed us how you routed them into the board. Now you can actually show us how you generate them into the board to kind of set your levels and kind of the types of things that you think are helpful for people trying to set level. You said around minus six dB. Yeah, that's that's a good starting point. And I'll show you actually how that would work inside Audition. So um, first of all, um, if you go into the effects menu here and then generate, and you go to tones, you'll get this um, control panel up here. Now, there are many presets here, but the best one to go for to start with to get a good tone is uh, actually the default one. And that will generate a 440 hertz tone. I usually like to put that to 1000 or 1 kilohertz, uh, as that's kind of the standard test tone. Uh, and it sounds like this. And as you can see there right now, it's it's peaking at around minus 18 uh, dB. Sorry, where uh, was the peak right here? Was it on the volume right oh, there? So the, the levels are right down at the uh, at the bottom, at the very bottom. If you if you scroll right down uh, to the oh yeah, down of, here. Okay. Yeah, Go ahead. and then you've got like um, you've got ah uh, okay. So the green bar pops up, and it's just okay. And how do we know? Oh, and it's actually going horizontally here. So you, oh, it's very, uh, it's got a lot of, uh, it's got a whole decibel map right there. Absolutely. <laughs> and you can change this, you can change the look of this. So you mm. can go into, um, let's have a look. Um, where are we? Levels, uh, panel group settings. Um, what I want to do, ah, that's it. You right click on the meters here mm -hmm. and then you can say, um, uh, let's, well, let's, um, Let's create a tone. Let's change this to minus 6 dB peak. That's going to be a bit louder, so I'll take it down on the desk. And you see that's just peaking there at minus 6 there. Now, what you can minus do is six. you can right click, and instead of dynamic peaks, you can say static peaks, and you get that sticky uh, mm. yellow line there, so you can see where your highest peak is. Now, this is really good. Um, obviously, if it's a test tone you're playing and it's an uh, you know an audio device like somewhere you're going to play music from, uh, that's absolutely fine. But if you're testing, say for instance, a microphone, you'll want static peaks on so you can see where your highest peak is. And I'll show you, Andrew, how how this might be uh, become effective. If I start recording now, this should record my audio. You'll see where my peak is. So now I'm talking, testing, testing, one, two, three, and you can see I'm you're way awfully. below awfully low yeah right so i'm going to normalize that so you can see that a little bit bigger and if i play that back so now i'm talking testing testing one two three and you'll see actually my static peak is is now just below zero db if i normalize to say minus three db so now i'm talking testing testing and you probably need to just reset the uh reset the meter there so static peaks again so now i'm talking testing testing one two three and now you can see after that i'm peaking at minus three mm -hmm. um so the idea is there you know obviously you'd want to peak at uh minus six with a microphone um but yeah i mean these meters these these are brilliant you can you can change the db range so you can get more or less db if you want to be sort of finer grains here and just get from 24 db up to zero uh you can make it like that uh you can even make these cool led meters so mm -hmm. you know which I like, so it's all aesthetics, really. But um, yeah, you, you, you could do stuff like that. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So when yeah. you added the normalization, uh, you just did you select the whole track there, or did you? Um, how did you select the audio to normalize? Did you just right click on the recorded clip? Yeah, that's right. So what what I do in Audition is I would double click some audio. Uh, uh -huh. That's select all, uh -huh. and then I would go into the favorites menu and by default in adobe audition there are two normalized favorites mm. normalized to minus 0.1 db and normalized to minus 3 db mm. so you can select those you can also access this feature in effects amplitude and compression uh, and then there is uh, normalized process just mm. here and again you can say normalize to a percentage level or again a db level so it might be i want to go to minus six like that mm. and apply 
and there you've got a normalization now to minus six. And for those watching who haven't normalized before, what normalization is doing is it's bringing, it's finding the highest peak in your audio and it's taking that peak and lifting all of your audio in a, in a uniform level up uh, so that the highest peak hits the, um, the amount that you specify. So if you say I'm normalizing to minus 6 dB, the loudest peak of your audio will be minus 6. If you normalize to minus 3, the loudest peak will be minus 3. The rest of the audio remains exactly the same volume, just slightly louder. Mm. Yeah, so so that is... Um, now, one thing I imagine that's useful is to, if you are doing something like this, where you want to go back and actually just, you're like, huh, my, my audio is too quiet. Now, what you the technique you showed here is doesn't work for live, right? It doesn't work for a live input. For that, you just have to push your, no. your sliders and your faders, right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But if you are doing this and you're going back to fix something to normalize it, um, and you could do audition. Again, you mentioned ScreenFlow has a normalize button, but is it best to kind of normalize the entire recording, even with all its mistakes, more or less, uh, rather than mm -hmm. chop up a bunch of different takes and clips and then try to normalize them all separately because they may be, the normalizations might be completely different from clip to clip. But if it has that whole yeah. long sample range, then it's it's kind of gives you a better overall um, normalization, yeah. I guess. And that you can then, yes. then, then you can start doing your edits and chop things together because things will sound okay. more or less at the same volume. Yeah, so I totally hear what you're saying. So you're essentially saying that um, if you've got just one output of your recording mm -hmm. uh, with various different levels, do you just normalize that? Mm -hmm. uh, or is there something else, another uh, sort of technique that you would apply? Or do you start cutting it first and then get your kind of, I guess I'm wondering the order of operations. At what point do you like to normalize prior to doing your editing or do you do your editing and then do your normalization? Uh, do I do my editing and then my normalization? So usually I would, um, in the first case, I would, I would normalize it to a safe level, mm -hmm. uh, or, or change, uh, again, you can change the amplitude really quickly using this kind of heads up display here. Mm -hmm. So I can, on the fly, I can turn the audio down or up a little bit. Um, but what I would do uh, initially is I would make sure it's not not peaking or not close to peaking, not close to zero dB or three dB. Um, I'd want it to be uh, sort of much quieter. And then I can apply um, effects such as um, filter and EQ, equalization, as we've we've spoken about earlier. I can increase the trebles, you know, take out certain frequencies. Uh, I can then add some compression. And when you're, particularly when you're adding compression, uh, it will usually take the volume of your audio down. So then after you've added all of these different effects that you want to to post-process audio, uh, I would then finally uh, normalize to the level that I want the audio to be. But then I can take it a step further and say, well, after you've done the normalization and everything's at a nice respectable level, you then want to be looking at... Um, if it's if it's pre-recorded, not obviously if it's live, you have less control over this if it's live. But if it's pre-recorded, you then want to look at um, getting your audio to the right loudness standard as well, um, which is something you can do uh, in post in Audition. Audition has native tools uh, for getting your audio to the correct loudness standard. It has like a, um, I think it also has a loudness radar meter here, um, and I think usually. The, the level for uh, internet streaming is usually minus 14 LUFs. They say in podcasting, it's minus 16 LUFs. So there's that kind of loudness war argument of minus 16 or minus 14. Hmm. Um, what is yeah, the loudness. difference between audio you know, normalization and loudness? Like, I guess that that's something not, that's a distinction I'm not familiar with. LUFs versus decibels. And right, I don't, so, what, and you're, I know, I understand it's probably a very complex answer. So we probably need to keep it as <laughs> stupid simple as possible just to get a very simple answer what should be how should people think about yeah. decibels and normalization versus how should they think about loudness okay so loudness the idea of loudness is that it is the the perceived volume of audio uh that the ear hears and 
the fact that if you're hitting the same loudness standard as the live stream before you, mm -hmm. uh, there should be no need uh, for the end user to turn the volume up or down on their computer or if they're watching YouTube live on their TV, they shouldn't need to turn up and down every time a new live stream or new video starts. The idea is it's the same with um, services like, certainly services like Spotify and iTunes. Uh, they absolutely insist that all music tracks are uh, at a loudness of minus 14 LUFs. And that what that means, like, like you say, Andrew, in, in layman's terms, is that this standard is in place so that you can listen to a Spotify playlist, for instance, and you probably notice you never have to turn your... your right. Uh, that's true. Speaker up or down. It's yeah. always a consistent volume. And I think back in the day when there were all kinds of different mastering standards and we had CDs and stuff, I do remember going from one CD to the next. I had to turn it up and down and up and down. <laughs> and, and, and when you're watching the TV and the ads come on as well, and uh, the ads are always louder for some right. reason, that's, that's loudness. <laughs> uh, interesting. <laughs> Yeah. So what it does with, with loudness and the reason there are plugins like uh, radars that kind of analyze audio over time. So they'll kind of go around and analyze and show you where, where the luffs are over time is that you want to get those those luffs as consistent as possible over the duration of all of your audio um, mm -hmm. so that you're, you're hitting that standard. Interesting. And so then with decibels and audio normalization and volume levels, that's not the same it's so by by adjusting to minus 3 db you are not necessarily hitting minus 14 luffs exactly yeah it's 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 a different measurement and it, it yeah it's it's complicated, it is <laughs> complicated. You're, you're essentially doing the same thing if mm -hmm. you're if you're turning audio up and down or normalizing uh you're essentially turning volume uh, turning the volume up and down but then when you're uh getting audio to a certain uh, LUFS level, you're also introducing things like true peak limiting, uh -huh. which means if the peaks are going above a certain uh, ceiling that you set, uh, they're getting kind of um, uh, just limited. Ramped down, limited, yeah. Cut, cut off at, mm -hmm. at a certain point. Um, I can demonstrate this in a way, actually, if, if you wanted to go back to the, the screen share, I can, I can make this audio that I just recorded uh, really loud. Or actually, I can use... Um, uh, I've, I pulled this up. This is a copyright free track. That looks track, by very the way. loud. Yeah, that is very loud. And this is the <laughs> thing with the, with the whole loudness thing and the loudness wars mm -hmm. is that um, a uh, you know a, a track like this, if you wanted to um, set it at a certain loudness standard, it would get whacked down. So it would probably, if I wanted to make this minus sixteen luffs, it would probably look something like that. Mm. It would go down like that. Whereas if you had a piece of classical music with lots of dynamic range, it would probably stay, you know, quite, the peaks would still be quite loud mm. uh, because, again, perceived loudness, the perceived loudness of a really compressed dance track, uh, you know, it, it needs to go down in mm. dB uh, as opposed to a piece of um, classical or jazz music with dynamic range. Interesting. Um, so yeah, I can show you. So it um, almost sounds like an almost, average, an average of across the entire waveform versus, say, the true peaks and the true valleys, right? Which is yes. normalization is is more towards that. It's it's closing the gaps between the dynamic range, maybe, and then the uh, the luffs maybe looks at the whole piece and says, okay, what's the overall sort of general level of loudness, perceived loudness? Exactly. Interesting. Yeah, that's okay. a good way to describe it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think I understand it a little better now. So yeah, so what are you doing? Did you want to show something here? Should we move on? Yeah, I will. Yeah, if you, if you want to stay on, on loudness, so I can show um, a visual plugin um, that I use uh, from FabFilter, which is the uh, Pro L2. Um, this will, um, what this will do, so say if I say, I want minus 14 LUFs for streaming here, and I play this piece of music. This is um, copyright free, by the way. It's from Epidemic Sound, so it's uh, you won't get any copyright infringement for me playing it. <laughs> uh, yes, although you, uh, Facebook and YouTube are sometimes not always uh, savvy on which ones are royalty free. They tend to shoot okay. first and ask questions later. But hey, we'll In just give case, it a shot. The, <laughs> no, just go for it. The, we'll see what happens. The audio off, <laughs> and I'll, I'll give you just the uh, the because the really what I wanted to show you is the visual display. So I'll I'll play this audio. So this is a uh, this is a dance music track, and as you can see, it's hitting uh, minus ten luffs at the moment. Um, and we're seeing so that on the right here. Okay, this this over here minus oh. ten luffs. Got it. Okay, I so put my mouse about I where it's hitting this down a little bit in in db and play it back and then you'll see 
it's going it's still really loud so i'm gonna i'm gonna turn this right down huh. and then what you can do this is, is cool to see the decibels and the luffs right next to each other there you the, go the decibels exactly. and the luffs okay and laughs. I, I really like this plugin for loudness. I mean, Adobe Audition has some fantastic uh, loudness tools itself. So, um, but I really like the way that this Pro L2 plugin from FabFilter actually visually displays, yeah. like you mentioned, the dB and the loudness that you're hitting. So now we're hitting minus 25 laughs. So, or minus 23, minus 25. Uh -huh. And this is the short term analysis. If you turn it to momentary, uh, it's going to be it's going to go up and down much faster. So, mm. like you say, short term is over a short period of time. So you're getting the idea, and then and you're you've, aiming. For you've made some adjustments already. You've taken the yeah. the dB. You've actually lowered the gain. Down, yes, okay. that's it. So then I can start to increase the gain, and that's what you're doing here with the slider on the left. Okay. That's it. Now it's way too loud. So plus I'm aiming seven, for my plus DVD. six, plus five. And you see how the, the, the hotness goes down. So now we're around right. And another right. thing I really like about this is you can turn from absolute to relative view. Mm -hmm. And then it will change it. Instead of the minus 14 I was aiming for, now we're aiming for zero on the meter, which is brilliant. For so relative. as long as that's just tipping on zero, uh, re exactly as you say, relative, uh, then you, you've got a good job there. And uh, you, Oh, okay. So you're still doing short-term analysis, but you've actually changed the LUFS sort of uh, measurement units to uh, to a uh, metric to a relative metric. Okay. Relative, exactly. But when you go back to absolute, you'll see it's it's again hovering around minus 14. And then you just apply. Um, uh, obviously, huh. it's going to try and process the whole track, so I won't let it do that. Um, but actually, there's one last thing I could show you here, um, which is quite interesting. So there's, I mean, to be clear, there's a relationship between the gain and the, the decibel levels you know the 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 and the, and the luffs, but but they're not a hundred percent correlative. I mean, they're not a hundred percent exact. You know, identical to each other because they're sort of looking or measuring and anal analyzing the audio in different ways and looking at yeah, exactly things. loudness and luffs. It's looking at the the the, the bigger picture, the mm -hmm. sort of overall um, volume over a, a period of time. Whereas right. I guess decibels is more in the moment mm -hmm. and if you if you keep pushing the audio up here um it's actually got a true peak limiter as uh, well uh. so it will it will start limiting your audio uh as you can see it's doing there so a yeah fabulous plugin really cool stuff <laughs> cool so there you go wow so that was a great little tutorial on something i didn't even realize so so uh um and just again the takeaway here if if you're looking to measure sort of relative loudness and luffs and that's something that you're wanting to do that the sort of the gold standard is is minus 14 for for podcasts and and sort of music tracks yeah so it, it is minus 14 is the accepted kind of streaming level although a lot of podcasters are um agreeing on and shooting for minus 16 i, I don't know podcasters always like to be different so. right okay <laughs> so streaming minus 14 if you're podcasting maybe maybe go for minus 16 interesting okay so um fantastic i think we should see if anyone has some questions about this stuff i mean i'm sure that we could obviously this is this is you should start a udemy course and if you haven't already mike and people can sign up to take your classes on this stuff because you're a fantastic teacher and you clearly have so much knowledge and i, I love sort of the, the visual demonstrations you're giving uh, just to teach these principles is, is awesome so i appreciate this master class right now in um, in audition and a sort of audio measurement and mastering um so I, i'm also seeing a lot of people in the comments leave similar types of question uh, uh comments they're saying wow this is amazing great job um so um, Ben wants to know uh, approximately what is the price range for that signature mixer board we talked about? Is it is oh, it wow. out of is it is it prohibitively expensive? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the one thing <laughs> I didn't mention. <laughs> so I can tell you in the uh, UK it is around. 400 British pounds and in the US oh uh, it's always cheaper in the US uh, 449 US dollars which that's, is not too bad, that's not really. too bad I've actually found that mixing boards are really reasonable I, I would always expect yeah. them to be way more expensive for like a 12 or 10 or 20 channel mixer and and like a thousand dollars or more and and I'm finding really good options for uh, yeah the 400 dollars range or less 
Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, I, I can absolutely say about this particular desk, I did a lot of research um, because I went for a while without actually having, I, I know in the UK we call them mixing desks, but when I say it in the US, you think of like an actual desk that you work from. So I must say mixing board, I'm sorry. No, it's <laughs> totally fine. I'm getting it. With a, with a, a mixing board. So I, I went without for a long time, um, particularly for podcasting. I mean, you can really do it with an audio interface. Um, but when I started doing more and more live and I wanted to bring Jing and sound effects in I was like yeah I'm gonna need a mixing board now so I did a lot of research and I found a lot that you know did you know horrible USB 1.0 connections uh, which I didn't want to go anywhere near or well, most of them just did the master output this is USB 2.0 mm -hmm. I actually really really was looking for a USB 3.0 uh, mixing board um, couldn't really find one um, I know focus right do some audio interfaces that I believe are Thunderbolt mm -hmm. uh, but again, I didn't want an audio interface. I wanted a mixing board, uh, which would act as my audio interface. So mm -hmm. I found this one. There is, I can say there is the Signature 10, by the way, which is two ninety nine US mm -hmm. dollars. Um, that also has USB, but I'm pretty sure um, as it's not MTK, it will just be master output. But if you're live streaming, that may be all you need. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, that's another one to consider. And then the, the further note down, and you notice there's a trend here uh, with Soundcraft. <laughs> I'm in love with Soundcraft. <laughs> uh, so I, I've used all kinds of other desks. I, I've used uh, Behringer before, um, but I, I don't know. I've just always found that the, the, the channels seem to be really clean um, uh, and, and nice uh, on every Soundcraft I've ever owned. Um, yeah, a, a level down, if you wanted to kind of, this is more for, for podcasting. I've not used this model, so I, I can't absolutely say that you should check it out and use it. Um, and again, they've got uh, knobs instead of faders, which I really don't like. Um, but it might be all you need if you just got a couple of inputs and you want a podcast or something. Then you want to look at the Soundcraft notepad range, and uh, right bang in the middle of that notepad range is the 8FX, and that comes in at 129 US dollars. And I think it's got about eight different channels on it, and it's got an effects board, so you can do cool things like this. Mm -hmm. Just for your 129. So, um, yeah. That's cool. So a lot, a range of options there for you. Um, obviously, cool. Soundcraft fan here, um, but uh, we, I think they, they, they're great, and I. You know, I think we had a Soundcraft here in the studio a while back. Um, right now, we're using an Alto. Uh, we also use a lot of Tascam because uh, Tascam sent us a bunch of yeah. great interfaces, which we like and work great with. And one of the nice things about the improvements we made in Wirecast last version was that same thing to respect multiple audio channels coming at the same time. So I assume oh, cool. Wirecast should be able to take those independent channels directly from your Soundcraft so, um, and should see up to yeah. 16 of them, I believe. Absolutely, yeah. If if Wirecast is recognizing the, all the different channels uh, from an audio interface, then um, you're going to have an absolute ball with the MTK mm -hmm. range of mixing desks, uh, mixing boards. Um, yeah, uh, that's brilliant news. Yes, should work. So let, you get back to us, um, test it directly, and let us know. And there is some compression and some um, some basic uh, filters and effects in there that you can play with in the pro version, uh, which you can apply to the different channels. One thing I'm noticing in the in the comments here is George and uh, Greg are talking a lot about um, sort of rendezvous and and different um, boards and MIDI controllers and and the way they do that. But one of the interesting points that George brings up is that at the moment um, when you want to bring in multiple guests like we're doing right now, it can be a challenge to break out their audio and adjust their levels independently. Uh, so particularly if you're using something like Rendezvous, which is built into Wirecast, at the moment, you cannot say route that audio externally to a mixing board like or mixing desk, um, as you put it, Mike, and, and then do the level adjusts on the fly there and physically and then bring it back into Wirecast for a master. Um, what you have to do is use Wirecast has sort of internal, very kind of basic gain controls, and 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 you can push and, and adjust things. But once again, it goes back to that principle, back to the source. I think you definitely want your guests, and maybe do a test or two to try to have them work with them to do some sound tests and make sure that they dial in their audio levels as close to possible uh, as possible to each other. And you can kind of master or sort of make them equal in Wirecast. Um, but if uh, bad audio in, there's not much you can do 
on the other end of it to improve much. Uh, most of the sort of improvements you can make will always come with working with them at their end to try to make sure their their microphones and their levels are 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 are, are good and and sound good coming in if if possible. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, there is. Uh, I mean, if you have equalization on your mixing board, then you can definitely sort of tweak a little bit if the mic just. You can't do much really if there's like horrible background noise, but if the mic just sounds a bit flat or it doesn't sound very good, you can just bring up maybe the treble a little bit, or if it's boxy and muddy in the bass, you can like throw a little bit off. Another cool thing to look into, and I, I know, you know, particularly in the age of, you know, computers and VST and AU plugins, um, we're getting away from hardware. Um, you can like throw like a, a preamp or a processor, an actual analog thing in the chain somewhere, and you can start like, you know, tweaking um, EQ that way. You can add real time compression on that way. Um, the this actual uh, board that I use it has an inbuilt DBX limiter on some of the channels. So what that means is if I shout really loud and I have the button pressed in uh, for the DBX limiter to be active, um, it's going to limit me. As you've seen, uh, I was demonstrating on on the plugin just a moment ago. Uh, it will just stop those peaks distorting essentially, so it, it cuts distortion out the chain. But if you get like a you know a, a whole rack with a compressor. Um, uh, a noise gate uh, is really handy as well. You can do some of that cool noise reduction stuff on the fly rather than having to worry about post. And like you say, Andrew, a lot of people watching this and using Wirecast are working with live video, so they kind of want to do... This is where analog kit is going to be really, really handy. It's when you're doing live stuff, for sure. Mm -hmm. Do you find um, there's a challenge with the more sort of in-the-chain compression or noise gates you're adding, more hardware, more processing to uh, delay and sync no no, no you I, haven't had much of an issue yeah no certainly uh i have not in this setup i have right here now i i don't have a, a preamp processor on this mic right now but usually i would have like a, a dbx long dbx processor running on my mic um, and that would introduce no latency at all. Everything would be real time in my headphones. Where I do find that happens is when I'm um, uh, sort of doing this inside programs like Audition and, and latency is introduced with every plugin I add. So you can do stuff in the multi-track of Audition. You can add multiple plugins and then monitor them real time. And the more you add, the, the more latency is introduced. So analog kit tends to be very, very real time and very cool. That is cool. Um, okay, so let's try to wrap up. I have a couple other comments here. I think um, maybe we'll we'll talk about. It. But here's just one from um, George. He says he's currently using the Sound Devices Mix Pre Three to help get clean audio. They have built-in delay and mix minus. Um, and let's see. Greg saying he'd love to see peak setting in Wirecast meters. Um, Greg, mm -hmm. you may want to play with the Wirecast Pro audio um, effects plugins. I believe there is a, a peak and a limiter in there you can use, so you can try those. Um, but of course, um, as you mentioned, Mike, there's there's analog uh, audio you can use. Again, going back to that Wirecast rendezvous comment, you will not easily be able to break out your guest audio into an analog chain and bring it back in or or do adjustments outside of Wirecast other than kind of just the gain and um, that kind of stuff. So if you really, really want total independent control over guest audio, then you need to set up something similar to what we have here, which is a, a an actual separate machine that's managing your call and your call audio, something like the Skype TX machine we're using, uh, which can break out each guest and each call into its own audio and video and you can route that through your board and then manage whatever you want there um, before it comes into uh, you know your Wirecast software, which is what we're currently doing with you, Mike. You are coming in on our Skype talk show machine, and then we can actually uh, make adjustments to your audio both in our Skype TX software or we can make adjustments to you on our Tascam board and, and brighten or add treble, whatever we want to do. Not that we need to do anything with your audio because um, it sounds <laughs> wonderful. 
Oh, that's cool. You have a really cool setup there. Tim. You've got like, you know, really cool stuff. Yeah, if you can if you can separate the processes out a little bit and sort of make different links to the chain. Now, we do find that does add some audio delay issues. Like obviously, in order for you to see our mix return here, our program mix, where you can actually see when you're on camera and see what the guests or I'm sorry, the audience is seeing, um, mm. we need to send you a mix minus that's a little ahead of when this sort of composited um, video output hits your eyes. So you were probably hearing me before you're seeing me. So I bet that's a little off-putting. I apologize for that. But uh, Yeah, your mouth isn't quite moving. Uh, no. Nor is <laughs> with the speech. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, that's that's unique to you uh, because it's, it's the return. But as far as where it all meets together in Wirecast and gets pushed out to the audience and should be incorrect in sync in general. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that's all sort of stuff you get into as you start messing with stuff. Um, okay. So, uh, Mike, uh, where can people, you, do you teach classes on this stuff? Do you have, I know you have a lot of YouTube videos. I've watched some of them. They're great. Um, do you have any formal ways of, um, of, for people to kind of learn more about this from you or interact with you? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the main place that I would, I would suggest people to go to, uh, is always my YouTube channel. Uh, everything is free on there, uh, at youtube.com slash music radio creative. I say it's all on the screen. That's, that's pretty much where you go to. Uh, and then from there, you know, if, if you like what I do, there, there are various links out to obviously our website where we, we create jingles and, uh, great, audio stuff any anything anything that's audio will will do it essentially and um i do i do provide uh, a small amount of of one-on-one -on -one coaching um uh during uh the month so if if you're interested in that again you know just reach out to me and uh and i can i can let you know more about that I want to pull up your YouTube channel so folks can see that. This is a fantastic YouTube channel. You've got a ton of awesome videos here covering everything folks might want to know about audio. Uh, it looks like you have some fantastic, fantastic uh, um, Adobe tutorial, audition tutorials. Um, you cover microphones and you review them as well as fixing distortion. I mean, really great stuff. So Mike, this is fantastic. It's such a great resource there. Uh, and again, reach out to Mike if you have questions or watch these videos if you want to learn more and sort of polish your own audio for your live broadcast. This was fantastic. I appreciate the deep dive. And um, again, we don't hold back on this show. We go deep in and there were some, some complicated topics that were covered as well as some basic tips, I think, for folks just learning to level match, learning why mixing desk is kind of important to have at your fingertips, literally, um, and why it should be called a mixing desk and not a mixing board. <laughs> But a mixing desk, it sounds like something you'd use in the kitchen. <laughs> it I'm really honest. does. really does. Really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so thank you so much, Mike. This was great. We will have to have you back on to talk more and maybe dive into some uh, more specific topics. I don't think we even got to half of what yeah. we wanted to talk about today. We're just so. scratching the surface, Andrew. I uh, mean, I could go for hours about this. We, we, could. we covered uh, loudness and, and DB and test tones and bits like that. But I could do uh, music remixing to match the length of your video. Um, creating music beds for your video in logic i mean uh, there's a ton of stuff so yeah yes and, and podcasting i really want to talk about that i want to see your sort of mastering process for taking a live show like this and then turning it into a fantastic podcast uh that people Absolutely. can listen to and we didn't ago. even touch on echo reduction and noise reduction and all those artifacts in post so <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yep there is a whole can of worms we can dive into and i think we should do it so if you're willing to stay up late again uh a few more times i think we should have you back on and let's Top, talk about some of those interesting topics because obviously you can tell um, I'm just a novice. I'm just barely uh, proficient at this stuff and, and it's so fun to have you on and really ask questions uh, because uh, you know all the answers right now. I'm, I'm so happy that you came on to share them with us. Sounds good. Really looking forward to the next time. All right, Mike. Take care. Uh, look for Mike at um, Music Radio Creative. Uh, you can find the website. There's the YouTube channel. Um, you saw the contact information. Let's throw that up one more time for people to view. And then we will sign off here. Uh, and so long and good night to you, Mike. And we'll see you next time.
Thank you. All right, guys. That was Mike Russell from Music uh, Radio Creative in the United Kingdom. He is a lovely person and a real expert when it comes to audio production, audio craft, and you can see um, just how much he knows. And it was so cool of him to uh, share his screen and jump in and do some on-the-fly tutorials with that. I hope to have him on again soon so we can talk more about that. If there's particular areas that you would like to learn more about, any of those topics around audio that you want more um, information about, maybe Maybe Mike and I can set up some cameras, some external cameras, and actually look at how the board is sort of arranged, how he maybe uh, kind of adjusts things and talks about, you know, a mixing desk. Maybe just a, an overview of that would be helpful. If you have other ideas like that or things you'd like to see on the show around audio, please let us know. Uh, you can always leave a comment on Facebook or YouTube or tweet at us at Wirecast, and we would be happy to take that feedback and bring it into the show. I want to say thanks to all of you, the viewers, for making this a fun and participatory show. Thanks for leaving your comments and questions. Uh, and again, I want to say thanks to our partners who also help us make this possible. This show would not be doable without all of the equipment. As we mentioned, the Skype TX machine is critical to our workflow and how we bring in guests and adjust their audio ahead of time. Uh, and there, of course, are many others, including Archon Mounts, uh, Aaron Roth, I see he joined us earlier on the Facebook um, stream and others. So thank you again. We will be back next week, same time, 2.30 p.m. Pacific time. Um, and thanks again, shout out to uh, viewers Greg and George for making this show fun and um, putting your comments in there. I think it was really cool to see you guys talking about different features and uh, feature requests as well as things that you're doing and using uh, for your own live video setups. I hope to continue that. You can always continue that discussion or leave other comments and posts in the Wirecast community on the Wirecast users group in Facebook. That's a great place to continue the discussion and the debate and um, talk about other things you're doing as well as don't forget to share your live streams. Hashtag where is Wirecast and you may just be picked for our live stream of the week. And we will see you next week with our live interview with Amy Porterfield. It should be a very fun show. We'll be putting out more information about that soon, and we'll send out an email to our email list uh, letting you know what is going to be covered and what she's going to come on the show and talk about. I think it'll be a fun show. So mark your calendars for next Thursday, July 19th, 2018, 2.30 p.m. Pacific time. This has been a Wirecast Live episode, and we will see you next time. Thanks for watching.